I'm Jean Pashke. This is Elsie Hellerman. Later, Mel Rara will be joining us. We're standing in front of St. Mary's Catholic Church in Melrose. This beautiful building is celebrating its centennial this year. It's one of many really large, beautiful churches that were built all over Stearns County by the immigrants who came here. But this particular building and its adjacent rectory had a special honor in 1993 when they were placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Minnesota State Historic Preservation Office, who decides such things, called St. Mary's historically significant as an institution of outstanding social, cultural, ethnic, and religious importance to the community of Melrose. It's interesting, the churches are seldom if ever placed on this register, so they must have felt this one had special significance. So we're going to talk about that significance, about the German immigrants who came here and built this church as St. Boniface, the Irish who joined them from their parish, St. Patrick's, and how they came together to form one congregation of St. Mary's. First, as briefly as possible, and here's how it came about. And it's interesting to remember that the very first settlers in Melrose in the late 1860s and early 70s when Melrose was being settled were by no means a Catholic majority. They were Yankees from New England, they were Protestants, and they built a Methodist and a Methodist Episcopal Church here. And of course, a group of German Lutherans formed St. Paul's. But the Catholics were in the minority, and some of them had to go as far as Collegeville or New Munich or Meyer Grove to find a church, to attend mass, to find a priest. There was a Father Augustine Burns, who was Irish, who would come here and say mass in the homes for the Irish, of course. And so, the first Catholic church in Melrose was founded in 1872, and it was St. Patrick's. And by that name, you can pretty well guess what its ethnic makeup was. They built a little wooden church, which they later upgraded to this typical white frame building with a tall steeple on 2nd Avenue East, which was replaced in 1916 by this stucco building, torn down in 1970. Meanwhile, in 1879, a number of German families left St. Patrick's and built a small church across the street here in the present parking lot. They named it for St. Boniface, an English-born missionary and martyr who converted the German tribes. He holds somewhat of the same place among German Catholics as St. Patrick does to the Irish. They broke ground for this present building in 1897 and moved in in 1899. Both of these churches had schools as well. St. Patrick's actually moved their worship area to the basement and held classes on the main floor. St. Boniface built a combined convent and parochial school in 1882. When the new church was built, school and convent moved into the old building. The school burned down in 1910 and was replaced with this building, which opened in 1911. In 1964, it became the Melrose Public Elementary School as St. Mary's students moved into this new facility. The old building was raised in 1984. So now Melrose had two Catholic churches. And it's easy to wonder, after all these years, why this should have been necessary. You had two churches which differed not at all in their basic doctrine. Their central worship experience was in a language neither one could understand. And uh, why couldn't everybody just get along? Well, you had to look at the way that these people viewed themselves as Americans. The Irish had suffered terrible persecution at the hands of the Protestant landlords. They were forbidden to vote, to hold office, to go on to higher education, to hold certain jobs, and frequently to worship. They saw assimilation as their key to fitting in in America. You could come to this country, you could lose your brogue, and you could be as an American as anybody else. Now the Germans came about it from a different perspective. It's interesting that most of the German immigrants, the early ones at least, came from the northern part of Germany, which was predominantly Protestant. So it's easy to assume that they too suffered religious persecution. But when you hear immigrant stories, you find this isn't the case. You hear that the oldest brother inherited the farm and they had nowhere to go, that there were no factory jobs, that they didn't want to be drafted into the Kaiser's army, that they simply wanted a better way of life for themselves and for their children. So. They came to this country and they settled around Stearns County and they all formed one neighborhood and some of them had literally been neighbors in the old country. And they saw no need to become Americans. They thought they could simply be Germans and continue their way of life here. They could speak German in the home. They could send their children to schools where they would be taught in German 
and when they went to church, they could hear a sermon in German. They could confess their sins in German. They didn't see any need to fit in and be Americans. And then there was the social aspect. The Irish regarded Mass as a social occasion. They could stand around after Mass and stand around the church steps and have a good gossip. The Germans tended to hop in their buggies and go straight home. But there was one, of course, a larger issue, and Elsie's going to tell us about that. Yeah, the Germans went to the Irish church. The, the Germans at the time gave donations toward the Irish church, and they felt that they should then have a sermon once in a while in their German language so they would get something out of the Mass and which was not granted. Then they were not allowed to enter their church no longer, so they had to go to the neighboring parishes, which was too far in buggy days. So then they went to the bishop and asked for permission to build their own church, which was granted. By the early 1950s, St. Patrick's was drawing up plans for a splendid new church. St. Boniface was changing too. The German language no longer counted for very much. The end of World War II kind of saw the end of that. There were second and third generation people attending this church, and they didn't think of themselves as Germans. They just thought of themselves as Americans. Still, what happened on August 9, 1958, came as a shock, didn't it, Elsie? It did, because in both churches, the same letter was read that uh, St. Patrick's and St. Boniface were to merge, and it was supposed to be called St. Mary's which happened about a week later. It did. It happened one week later, didn't it? They were each uh, one mass. This was not a happy occasion for anybody, was it? Nobody said, oh, isn't this wonderful? We're all going to be one Christian congregation worshiping together. Nobody danced a jig, nor a polka. What did they do, Elsie? Well, out in the rural areas, you really didn't hear very much. But after they did it changed then uh, Father Julie said we put Mary in between St. Patrick's and St. Boniface to keep the peace. So, so let's look at this wonderful building. The architect was George Bergman, a German native working in St. Cloud. He knew what a German church should look like. Father Bernard Richter was pastor here and together they planned this church to be built in Romanesque revival style. Typical Romanesque revival touches are the rounded arched windows and doors and just the heavy, solid method of construction, the way it sits on the ground, and inside we'll see the ribbed ceilings. Typical Romanesque revival touches. They added another thing as well. Father Richter had traveled in Bavaria and Austria, and he had seen many churches with domes, and he wanted domes on his church. Domes, he got two of them, and they're about 130 feet up there on the east facade. The church was built of red pressed brick from Wisconsin and dark gray granite from St. Cloud. The granite was cut at Lukemeyer Brothers Marble Company, which was located across the street where Genio stands today. And volunteer parishioners hauled it over by wagons and carts, and they helped the stonemasons and hod carriers. The columns are made of polished granite with ornate stone capitals. Each one is adorned with a gargoyle. Very ugly looking gargoyles, I think, but then that's the function of a gargoyle, to be ugly. The main entrance has granite steps and granite railings. The exterior has changed a bit over the years. Some balustrades and pinnacles were removed. The domes were painted red. Glass blocks were installed in the basement window. And of course, in modern times, an elevator and fire exits were added. But basically, it hasn't changed too much in 100 years. I think its builders would recognize it. Let's go inside. Mel Rarell joins us now. Mel has been giving tours of St. Mary's Church for years. I asked Mel to give us a brief version of his tour and he was kind enough to do so. Now remember, this is just a shortened version, so be sure to come back another time to get the full tour. St. Mary's is very special. Not even 40 years in the naming, and we are celebrating 100th year centennial. Let's review the history of this and how it all came about. It was in 1850 the first missionary arrived. His name was Father Francis Pierce. He administered to the natives in the area. And in 1866, the first mass was held. And then in 1867, an Irish monk, Father Burns, arrived. And he was most welcome because the homilies would be in English. And then in 1872, 13 Irish families organized and built the first church in the area and they named it St. Patrick's. And then in 1877 and 1878, 12 German families petitioned 
to have their own parish and built a 30 by 90 free frame church at a cost of about $3,000. An extension was built on, and that was in approximately 1895. But in 1897, work commenced on the present stately structure, built of red brick and granite facing. Dimensions are 76 by 184, 135 feet, 130 feet high. Corn cornerstone was laid in 1898. Dedication day was June 7, 1899. The cost was approximately $50,000. It was named St. Boniface. The stately structure with its Bavarian Austrian style onion dome stand out from the north, east, west, and south. Then in 1958, a letter from Bishop Bartholomew, dated August 9, 1958. Contents were no more Sunday Masses after August 17, 1958. Father Francis Julik will be pastor of the new parish and they will be named St. Mary's. Father Hoffman will retire to the old rectory over at St. Patrick's. Then in 1991, 92, 93, there were four people that start working to put the church on the National Registry. They were Elsie Hellerman, Evelyn Hessian, Joe Beckerman, and myself, Mel Rural. In 1994, we have had the word that we were accepted and we had our celebration on June 11th and 12th. We have now entered the south door of the church. The first thing we see are the robes that uh, on the bells in the tower. They played an important part in many years ago because they told the people if somebody died, they rang for each year they were old, they rang. And another, if there was a disaster, the church bells would ring so people would go outside and see if there was any smoke, then they knew there was a fire in town. And the bells are still used and they sound great. And they uh, also rang them on a different time of the day. I remember 12 o'clock noon, and I think it was seven in the morning and five in the evening. We have now uh, entered St. Mary's, and the year when it was St. Boniface, there was an altar on the south side of Blessed Mother holding Jesus. The statue is still in church up in front by the North Confessional and there was the vigil lights were back there, it was on a round metal table, and there was a kneeling bench that people could come in, say a prayer, and a light a light, and be on their way. The north side also had a little altar, and that was St. Anthony there, and a kneeling bench. Now, the church also has 16 glass stained windows, and stations which were very pretty, but were cut down, the, the trimmings were taken off. And in the background on this particular station, notice the, the throne of the king back in the background there. And that's also the time when the pulpit was taken out of church. It was a pretty pulpit, had nice statues around. They tried to find it back, but they didn't find it back to reinstall it. And it was on the fourth pillar from the front on the south side. On the north side, on the fourth pillar, was the crucifix with Jesus on. When we get further up to the front, there was the communion railing that was used every Sunday for communion. The doors of the communion railing are now our altar, the wooden altars that were redone. I don't remember the year. <laughs> Then we get up to the altars, or the baptismal fount. The baptismal fount was in somebody's yard as a birth bath, and it was uh, restored, and it looks pretty. And the confessionals were also redone. We just had draped curtains on, and when the church was painted the last time is when there was doors put on. That was done when, uh, after Vatican II, when you went to confession face to face, that's when they changed it to give them more room. Elsie, tell us about some of the priests that have served this parish in the last hundred years and more. Well, mine would only go back 80. <laughs> I remember Father Willenbrink, when he'd come here, 
he uh, liked the young people and he is the one that built the Dutch Hall and put the playground for the school children. But he got pneumonia and died when he was young. And we then had uh, a pastor, the associate pastor, become our administrator that took care, and that was Al Kramer, uh, a son from St. Boniface. Uh, after that, Father Shermus uh, couldn't be in the army because he had a bad knee. But he still had a nice uh, pamphlet made for the veterans. He always felt toward the soldiers. And then we had Father Hoffman. He liked to build, but he did not like the Dutch Hall. He says, I can't see anybody losing their soul on account of the hall, and he had it pulled down. It was built in 1926, and it uh, had dances, uh, wedding dances. We had our wedding dance there. And it had many plays, and the curtain was uh, a picture of Birch Lake, which was very pretty, and had bowling alley in the basement, where they bowled like they do now in the bowling alleys. And there were lots of things that happened in the hall. They had plays, and the year I graduated from eighth grade, the rural um, school superintendent, or what his name was at that time, was Berger. He had uh, a graduation ceremony. I remember we could carry flowers, and I know I carried ferns. <laughs> so I got my diploma at the Dutch Hall, and all the rural children did at that time. So, but then a few years later, then they said it was cracking, and they, they pulled it down, and that's where the school now is. And then Father Hoffman was a builder. He was always doing something. He was building. Uh, Fatima statues, Christmas cribs, and he built the Fatima shrine outside. In spring, he mentioned, if you pick rocks, bring the little ones over here so we can build a grotta, because the next year was going to be his golden jubilee, and he wanted it finished by that time. So, and when Father Lutkin was here, that was after Vatican II or with Vatican II, he put the altar on the south side, moved the pews, and the church was a disaster. <laughs> when it was a funeral, it was just hard to get in, do anything in church. So when Father Lang come, he changed it back to what it is now. And, and when Father Kiefer was here, he added the elevator, he restored the baptismal font, and looked up a lot of history. He was always searching for more history. And when Father Zimmerman was here, the church was put on the National Registrar. And now we have Father Vince. The statues on the altar of St. Mary's have changed a bit over the years, as we've seen, but one thing remains constant. When St. Mary's was organized, Father Francis Julig, who was the pastor, made sure that St. Boniface was placed on the left, and the statue of St. Patrick was brought over from St. Patrick's Church and placed on the right. And then, when they realized that St. Patrick was shorter than St. Boniface, they built a pedestal for him to stand on so everything would even out. St. Patrick. Patrick was also a bishop. Notice his bishop's hat and his shepherd's staff. He is a patron of the Irish. Irish railroad workers, some of the first people to come to Melrose back in the 1860s. Patrick holds a shamrock. He used to teach about God one God and three persons. Notice all the snakes at his feet. The legend says that St. Patrick drove all the snakes out of Ireland. The statue of St. Boniface, the first patron named of the parish and the German people. St. Boniface was a bishop. Notice his hat and his shepherd's staff. He lived in the seventh century, 680 to 750. 54 AD. He was a martyr and he was killed for being a Christian. His feast day is June the 5th. The Blessed Virgin Mary has a center spot. Our parish is named after her, St. Mary's. This statue was donated when the parish was renamed in 1958. At the time, the pastor wanted Mary to keep peace between the Germans and the Irish. Mary has done well.
these images are on the high altar. A picture of a bull, an eagle, a lion, and a child. And they represent the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This canvas is the ascension of the Lord into heaven. And you will find some material things in this here picture that the artist put in there, this here building for an example. It is because he was here on earth. And the four apostles, they're just astonished that out of nowhere he just rises into heaven. This canvas is the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary into heaven. It is just the mystery and in this here picture, you will find there's no material things in whatsoever. It is just as quietly, the angels are there, they have taken into heaven, the clouds are there, and she disappears. The assumption of the Blessed Mother into heaven. Saint Elizabeth of Hungary. She is one of the most loved saints of the German people. She lived in the 13th century. She was a princess. Notice the crown on her head. After the death of her husband, she helped the poor. And when one of the relatives stopped her, she had her apron up, and she thought they had food in there, that she was forced to open up her apron, and what fell out was a dozen of roses. And then we go into the next picture. It's Mary, Queen of Heaven. Mary is a, before Mary, St. Mary was named in 1958. This was the Marian statue in the church. Mary is shown holding her son, Jesus. She has a crown on her head, is holding a royal scepter and a sign of King of Queen. <clears throat> then we go to the next picture, St. Cecilia. We don't know exactly when St. Celia lived, sometime between the 2nd and the 15th, 5th century. She is the patroness of musicians, especially church musicians. The story is told at her wedding, she sang to God in her heart and didn't even hear the wedding music. She is holding an organ keyboard. She is a martyr. She was killed because he, she was a Christian. And she is also holding a palm branch in her hand. Let's talk about the first statue, St. Alois of Gonzaga. He is a patron of Catholic young people. He was a priest who lived in the 16th century. As a young man, he devoted himself to God and lived a holy and pure life. He also spent much time caring for the sick day and night. He himself caught a disease and died at the age of 24. The next statue, the middle statue, St. Joseph, husband, of Mary and foster father of Jesus. Joseph was the guardian of the Holy Family and is the patron of the whole church. He is, ho he is shown holding a staff with a blooming flower. The story is told that many men wanted to take Mary as their wife. All of them put a staff in the synagogue overnight and Joseph was the one that bloomed, a sign that God had chosen Joseph to be the one. The next statue is the statue of St. Henry. St. Henry was an emperor of the German people in the 10th and 11th centuries. He is a favorite saint of the German people and had a remarkable concern for building up the church. He is shown holding a church building in his hand. This is behind the altar. The table you see is what Marie, the one that takes care of the flowers, rearranges them and transplants them. And here, the first doors were the servers' gowns, and here are the flower pots, the vases, and the things she needs for her work to keep them looking well. And 
And then the first doors, the server's gowns, they're according to size and according to seasons. This, these are uh, extra candle holders, and behind the altar is stored. This door goes behind the altar, and that is where the banners of different societies are stored. This is the a kneeler that is used for t confessions before holidays when extra priests come in. Now, this is where the altar linens are in stored in the drawers. And this vestment with St. Boniface on was donated back to St. Uh, St. Mary's Parish by Monsignor uh, Peter Lorso. It's very pretty. It's made very well. This uh, is to set the basilican bells when to ring. Now this is under the main altar in church and there has been no decision made as who they are. No one seems to know. Now this is the old organ that was bought in 1905, and this is the new organ that replaced the old one in the 70s, and it blocks the round window in back of the organ. We're outside of St. Mary's Rectory. St. Boniface's first rectory was built in 1889, just south of the old church, and it was destroyed by fire in 1910 when the school burned. But meanwhile, in 1907, this splendid new one was built. Father Bernard Richter, who had helped plan the church, was the first occupant of the new rectory. It was built of red brick and gray granite to match the church, but the architectural style is Queen Anne Victorian. Typical Queen Anne touches are the tower, the pillars, and the ornamental brackets under the eaves. Like the church, the exterior hasn't seen much change. The veranda has been enclosed, and a garage has been added in the rear. Even the hitching post is still in place. This was quite the thing when it was built, wasn't it, Elsie? Yes, it was built large because if the bishop ever got here to confirm the children, there's no way he could get back to St. Cloud, so he would have to stay over. And that is why the parish houses were built big in, uh, in the early 1900s. And priests too, priests come from a distance, they always had to stay. 